Okay. It's a great pleasure to introduce you guys to David Trotter, who um, finished a, a recently a PhD in this very pandemic times, poor thing. So, you know, it's a, it's a bit harder for him to be uh, talk, giving talks about some of the interesting work that he's been doing recently. And today he's going to talk to us about so, all sorts of interesting completions. Uh, and, you know, everyone is allowed to ask him lots of questions because I will be asking him as many questions as I feel I need to. It's a, I think that um, I'm very proud of the Bay Cat people for kind of coming and listening to hard mathematics on a Saturday morning. And I think, you know, we deserve to congratulate ourselves and, 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 and to be nice to, to people who want to talk to us about this kind of exciting new frontier. So take it away, David. Start your sharing. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Valeria. So uh, do you see now the, the slide? Yep. Mm -hmm. OK, the audio is OK. So I think that uh, we can start. Thank you again for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work uh, today. And uh, well, in this talk, I want to present a joint work with uh, Mili Maietti and Margherita Zorzi about a free construction called the existential completion, its connections with the sum choice principles as the rule of choice or the Hilbert epsilon operator, and finally, its applications. Well, the main language that uh, I will use is the language of doctrine. And recall that the notion of uh, primary doctrine or ex existential doctrine or um, elementary doctrine are a natural generalization of the notion of hyperdoctrine introduced by Lovier in order to provide a categorical framework for first order theories. Well, the, the intuition is that, for example, an existential doctrine is a functor which has enough structure to interpret the existential quantifier in the right way. Similarly, an elementary, the, an elementary doctrine is a functor which can interpret the quality. So this is the intuition behind this categorical instrument. Well, the main goal of, of this talk is first to introduce this construction, the existential completion, and I want to give a complete description of this uh, categorical instrument. And in the, in, the, in the second part, I will show how we can generalize the existential completion. And we will see a lot of examples of uh, known doctrines which arise as uh, instances of existential completion. So this is the plan. So well, should we uh, see the uh, starting slide? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I don't. Yeah, should we see the starting slide? Because um, we see the first slide, and I, I, I feel that you are changing the slides, but we don't. No, see no, 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 no. <laughs> this is again the first slide. This is the second. Do you see the second? Right. Yep. Okay. Now, I want just to give you, an, before starting with all the details, uh, I want just to give you an intuition of what, what is, what the existential completion is. So this is a free construction that starting from a primary doctrine produces an existential doctrine. This is a free construction. So we can consider the two monad denoted in this way on the two category was um, objects are primary doctrines. So this two monad has a lot of interesting properties. In particular, we have that the two category of, was um, objects are the algebras for this monad is equivalent to the two category denoted in this way was objects are the existential doctrines. So this means that the existential structure of a doctrine is encoded by an action. So if we have a doctrine P, the existential uh, structure is encoded by this action, which gives uh, to the doctrine P the structure of algebras for these two monads. Now, what I want wait, to- Wait, 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 wait a minute, because you know, before doing 
anything like that, you needed to say to us what, you know, the original story of the, the of, of the hyperdoctrines and, and because they yes. already deal, dealt with exist, existentials in, in, in for all in logic, right? Yes. So, this, so in this in this in this slide, I want just to give you an idea. I will give all the detail in the next slide. This is just to give you a, a plan and I want just to explain okay. how we can use the existential com completion to study the behavior or the properties of a, an existential uh, structure on a doctrine. So okay. I, I will give all the detail and I will explain how these categorical instrument, instruments are connected with the logic in the, in the following slide. Right, so the A is just an action. Yes, in this case, we have that uh, the existential structure is represented by an action which gives to a doctrine P the structure of algebras for this two monad. So this is an algebraic representation of an existential doctrine. Okay. So this two monad is lack side and potent. And this means that the action, this action is unique. So we have that the existential structure is essentially a property, not only a structure. So this is the first result. Now, what I will show in this talk is that this action contains a lot of information about the features of the existential quantifier on a given doctrine. So in the first part, I will show, I will fill this diagram in particular. We know that the two category of algebras is equivalent to the two category of existential doctrines. Now, in the first part, I will show what existential doctrines correspond to the three algebras and the, what are the, and the, what uh, existential doctrines correspond to the idempotent algebras. So in the first part, I, I will fill this diagram. This is the, the main goal of, of the first part. And we will see that, for example, uh, this characterization involve involves the sum choice principles as the rule of choice or, or the Hilbert epsilon operator. So this is the, the plan. Now, I would like to start by showing how we can construct a functor from a first order theory. In particular, if, because I want to start with this construction because I think that this is the, uh, right example to have in mind for the rest of this talk. Well, if we, we have a first order uh, language denoted in this way and a first order theory, we can define a functor from this category to the category of inf semilattices. Well, the base category is the category was um, objects are contexts, so lists of variables, and an arrow is uh, essentially term substitution. So we have that an object of, of this category is a list, where uh, these are the sorts, and these are the variables over the signature. And we include the, em the empty list. So in particular, this category, as finite products. This because we assume that uh, we are taking uh, lists up to half equivalence. So this is the Bay category associated uh, to a first order signature. A morphism is uh, uh, just a list of terms from this list, which is an object of the base category to this list. So every term is of this type, where this is a type of the second list, and it is in the context of the first list. So this is the category of lists and the term substitutions. And, and why are you calling it LT? Right. 
This because uh, we can assume, for example, uh, LT, this functor. Yes. Yes. Now, now, now I need to define how the composition of two morphism works, and then I will explain what is this functor, because this is just the definition of the base yeah. category. So this is the base category. The composition of uh, two morphisms is given just by the substitution. So this is the base category. Now I need to explain what is the what is this functor. Well, the functor assigns to a list of variables the set denoted in this way of well-formed formulas in that context. So this is a, a poset where we consider the following order. We say that a, a, an element, so a formula is less or equal to another formula if this holds modulo the theory. So this is the order. And then we quotient in the usual way in order to obtain a partial order on this set. Excuse me. Uh, yes. Did you uh, like explain what inf sl is like? Yes. The, the meaning yes. of the, the abbreviation. Yes. This a lot. So we have that. This is a par um, a partial order, but in particular, we can consider, for example, the conjunction of two formulas. So we have that every poset has finite infs. So. This is the reason why I denoted in this way this, uh, this category. So this is a functor that we can construct starting from a first order theory. And I will show that this is exactly the construction that we want to generalize with, with the notion of primary and existential and elementary doctrine. So. Oh, just a sec. Uh, Vlad, did you get semilattice? That's what, what David is talking about. Inf semilattices. So you remember ah, I see, I see. a lattice yes, has yes. a meat and a join. The inf is, is, the, is the meat, and you just yeah. look at that structure. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. I was just thinking. Thank you. So, and given a morphism of the base category, we, has, we, we have that this, this functor x as the substitution on a given formula. So if we have a formula of this kind, the functor acts as the substitution. So this is a functor. And now I want to, I want to show how we can generalize this, uh, this definition, this construction, and we can see the definition of primary and existential doctrine. So this is the first construction from a first order theory to a functor. Well, a primary doctrine is nothing else than a generalization of this construction. So a primary doctrine is a functor from the opposite category of a given category C with the finite products into the two category of inf semilattices. So this is exactly the generalization of the previous construction. A primary doctrine is said existential if for every object A1 and A2 of the base category and for any projection, we have that this functor, which is the evaluation of the doctrine on a projection, has a left adjoint denoted in this way and this satisfy two technical conditions, which are the beck chevalier condition and the Frobenius reciprocity. Again, an existential doctrine is exactly what we need to interpret the existential quantifier. So if we consider the functor defined in the previous slide, well, this functor has exactly this property because we can define the left adjoint along the weakening functor. So this is an existential doctrine. It has the right structure to interpret an existential quantifier. Similarly, a primary doctrine is said elementary 
if for every object A of the base category, there exists an object denoted in this way, which represent the trivial uh, equality, which is an object of this fiber, such that this assignment gives a left adjoint to the functor, which is essentially the evaluation of the doctrine on the di diagonal. So this is the, the first requirement. And the second is that for every morphism of this form, so it is essentially a morphism of the form identity times diagonal, we have that this assignment <clears throat> gives a left adjoint. So this is the definition of element, an elementary doctrine. And again, this, these two conditions are exactly what we need to interpret the equality in the right way. Okay. Now stop a little bit and let's yes. talk names, right? Because you did not explain why it was called LT. What's the L for? What's the T for? And, you know, and the same thing. I mean, I understand that we are doing yes. what we normally do for categorical logic uh, descriptions yes. that, that we have from, from, from many years and stuff. And we are just generalizing it by saying, we want anything that such, that looks like one of those. That's that's good. Thank you. Uh, but I don't know why they are called primary doctrines. And I wanted to know about the name primary. Okay. And I, it's like I primary to... ideal, right? Sorry. It's like primary ideal in uh, rings. No. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the the, the te terminology comes from rings, but. Um, so uh, the first name is the functor LT. And LT means Lindenbautarsky algebras. So this oh. is the reason why we use this notation because this, this uh, construction, this posit, is essentially the Lindenbautarsky algebra associated to a first order uh, theory. This is the reason why it's denoted by LT. Excellent. Okay. And then primary. primary, it is just a convention because this is the minimal requirement that we we ask for a fragment of logic. The, the reason is, is the following, that if the uh, deposit, well, we want that at least to have, we want at least to have um, the top element because the top element uh, represent the, the true predicate. So this is essentially the minimal requirement that uh, one uh, could ask for a functor in order to interpret the uh, first order theory. So this is just, uh, yes, the, the minimal structure that we require. This notation uh, was introduced by Maietti and Rosolini in their work. And similarly, an existential doctrine is called existential beca because it can interpret the existential quantifier in the correct way. Okay, and that's great. Thank you. Now you can carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you have a, any question, please, you, you can stop me when, when you prefer. So these are the three definitions that I will use along this talk. So if, uh, do you have any other question? I'm good now, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we can see some, uh, some examples now. Well, the main example of primary doctrine is the subobject functor. So in this case, we can consider a category C with finite limits. And well, the functor denoted in this way, which assigns to an object A deposit of its subobjects, well, this functor is the first example of primary doctrine. Notice that the, for a given arrow, the functor because this is the evaluation of the subobject functor on this morphism. But well, is essentially given by pulling a subobject back along F. So the subobject is a the subobject functor is a primary doctrine, and it is an elementary doctrine. However, it is not an existential doctrine. It is an existential doctrine if and only if the base category is regular. 
So this is the first example. The second example is the weak subobject functor. So in this case, we consider a category with finite products and weak pullbacks, which mean weak pullbacks, well, means that uh, we have pullbacks, but uh, we don't have, we haven't got the um, uniqueness. So if we have a base category D, which has a finite products and weak pullbacks, then we can, we can define a doctrine given by the functor of weak subobjects. So this is the poset given by the poset reflection of the slice category on uh, an object A. And again, for every arrow from B to A, this functor is given by a weak pullback along uh, uh, of an arrow G with F. And this is uh, an existential doctrine, and this is also elementary. So these are the two examples that we will see in the final part. But yes, this is the subobject functor is the main example. And this is another version of, uh, of weak subobject. And uh, I would like to mention a third example, which is a particular case of the first one, which is the set theoretical. Um, set theoretic doctrine. So in this case, we have that the base category is the category of sets and functions. And well, for every set A, we denote, it, we denote by S of A, the posit of uh, its subobject, of, its, of, its, um, of the subset of the set A. And the order is given essentially by the inclusion. So for every function, we have that the functor given by the evaluation of the functor F of the functor S on the, on the arrow F acts as the inverse image for every subset of B. So this is a particular case of subobject doctrine. Now, I want just to introduce the two categorical structure of the two category of primary doctrines. Well, if uh, we consider the class of uh, primary doctrines, we can define uh, once the one cells and the two cells and uh, these assignments gives to, the, to this class, the structure of two category. In particular, we have that uh, a one cell, which is an arrow of primary doctrines, is given by a pair where the first component is a functor which preserves finite products. And the second component is a natural transformation from the doctrine P to this functor. So these are the one cell of the two category of primary doctrines. A two cell, is a natural transformation from a functor F to a functor G, such that for every object A of the base category and for, for, for every element alpha in the fiber, this inequality holds. In a C, and uh, we can, uh, for example, we can define in a, similarly, we can define the two category of uh, existential doctrines and the two category of elementary doctrines. What, uh, uh, well, we just need to ask that, for example, in the case of the two category of um, existential doctrines, well, we need to ask that uh, one cell preserves the existential quantifier. So, and similarly for the two category of elementary doctrines, we need to ask that uh, the one cell preserves the equality. Okay, stop, stop again. Uh, yes. What is this R there? Uh, what? Where does the R come, come from? The, the capital R, yeah, that one? The, I, I don't understand what you um, it's, it's a It's a doctrine, uh, primary doctrine from yes. Diop P to InfoCell. P and R are two primary doctrines. And uh, this is a one cell of primary doctrine. So it is given by a functor 
from the two base categories and a natural transformation. P and R are two primary doctrines. Right. Now I would like to give you an intuition of what is a one cell of primary doctrine, which is the following. Good. Well, if we consider a first order theory, we can define as in uh, as we have seen in the in the first uh, in slide this the syntactic primary doctrine denoted by LT, and this is again the the category of uh, lists and substitutions. And well, if we consider one cell from this doctrine to the set theoretic doctrine, this is a, exactly a model of the theory denoted in this way. So again, a one cell between the primary doctrines is nothing else than a generalization of the notion of model. This is the intuition from the logical point of view. Do you have any question about these two categorical structure? So? I do, but I'll keep my question for later. Okay. So, I need to introduce uh, two definitions involving, which um, involve the some choice principles, because uh, I will use uh, the, these uh, choice principles in in the final uh, part of, uh, of this uh, characterization. And well, for an, an existential doctrine, we say that the doctrine P satisfies the rule of choice if for every element of this fiber, such that this holds, then there exists an arrow, which is a witness in the base category, such that this odds. So the arrow F represent a witness of this statement. This is the, the rule of choice. Moreover, we say that a doctrine, an existential doctrine P is equipped with the epsilon operators. If for every object B and A of the base category and for any alpha of uh, this fiber, there exists an arrow denoted in this way because it depends on alpha such that these two proposition are probably equivalent. Notice that this is a, a very strong requirement, in particular, if a, a, an existential doctrine is equipped with um, epsilon operators, well, it satisfies the rule of choice. So we can start now with the, the existential completion. And, and I want to explain, so I want to explain how we, can const, how we can construct an existential doctrine starting from a primary one. So let P be a primary doctrine. The existential completion is a doctrine denoted in this way, where for every object A of the base category, the new posit denoted in this way is defined as follows. An object is a triple where the first two elements are objects of the base category C and the third one is a proposition of the fiber on A times B. The order is given as follow. We say that A, B and alpha is less or equal to A, C and beta if there exists an arrow f from a times b to c, such that this inequality holds, where this is the projection on the first component. So with, the, with, this, um, with this assignment, we have that the, this is a primary doctrine and, this, and it is also an existential doctrine. And this construction can be extended and it gives a two monad on the two category of primary doctrines. And this two monad is lax identipotent. So this means that the existential structure 
is essentially unique. Moreover, we have- the Sorry, I, I missed a little, the last bit. It means that the, the what is, I mean, you're saying that the, the, the this two monad is lax idempotent and it means in what? I just so, didn't hear. We have that the two monad is last is lax idempotent. So this means that if we have, uh, this means that the action which gives to um, a uh, doctrine, the structure of uh, algebras for this monad is uh -huh. unique. So unique. we have that. So we have uh, the, this isomorphism between the two categories of existential doctrine and the two categories of algebras. And well, this means that the existential structure is unique. So we have a unique way to define an existential quantifier on a primary doct on an existential doctrine. This is the, the meaning of this uh, result. Now, a first application, this is um, an, uh, just uh, an application to the exact completion of uh, an, an elementary existential doctrine. We have that there exists a B a junction between the two categories of uh, exact category into the two categories of elementary and existential doctrine. This because the existential completion preserves the elementary structure. So we can prove that there is uh, the two functor which sends an exact category into the subobject doctrine on this uh, category. Well, this two functor has a left be a joint. And this result generalized the exact completion introduced by Maietti and Rosolini for elementary and existential doctrines. Now, now uh, I yes, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, stop there a minute. Um, so proving that there is this complete, so the first theorem here is proving that there is the existential completion, right? Yes. And, and, and the second one is kind of using it. In, the second but, one is the first application, exactly. It is an application of this construction. We, we can use this construction to prove that there is a B junction between the two categories was uh, objects are exact category in the two category of uh, elementary doctrines. Sure. Um, what I'm saying, uh, so, you know, it, kind of, we, we want to kind of bring these things back to, to what we knew before. And, and that is the, uh, you know, we always knew that regular categories then, and then you talk about exact categories and, and, and then you kind of got finite complete categories because you kind of, completing the products of the categories, but in this case, um, in a much more higher level sort of version. That's good. Exactly, yes, this is uh, exactly, yes. This is the idea because we know that, uh, for example, a carbon introduced the, the exact completion for a category with finite limits. And well, this is exactly a generalization of this result because we can construct an exact category starting from an elementary doctrine, which is a generalization of the notion of uh, a, um, a category with finite limits. Okay, thank you, good. Now, now I want to introduce another definition. This because in, I want to show how we can um, how we can um, characterize the free algebras for this monad, and we will see that the free algebras are exactly those doctrines, those existential doctrines, which looks like the syntactic doctrine associated to the regular logic. So I need to introduce this uh, new notion of quantifier free, and well. If we have uh, an existential doctrine, 
an object alpha of the fiber is said quantifier free, the idea is that we are going to define what are what are the, the what object are free from the existential quantifier in the internal language of the existential doctrine. This is the the idea behind. Oh my God. Can't Hello? Hear you. Hello? Hello? Uh, uh, now I'm, I'm hearing you, Vlad, but I was missing David. Uh, were you missing him too? Yeah. Do you, do you yes, hear David, me? But we cannot hear David. Do you hear me? Yes, we do hear you now. Now we do, yeah. So you were saying there was quantifier and then there was silence. Yes. yes. So the, the intuition behind this definition is that an object is said quantifier free if it is free from the existential quantifier in the internal language associated to the existential doctrine P. So this is the idea. Now, an object is said quantifier free, P quantifier free, if for every arrow F from B to A and for every element beta, we have that if this inequality holds, then there exists a, an arrow G from B to C such that this holds, this inequality holds. Again, the intuition is that an object which is P quantifier free is a formula which is free from the existential quantifier in the internal language of the existential doctrine P. Okay, but, but how, how do we see that on this PF of alpha less than, I mean, before I could see what you're talking about, about the witness function, but here I, I, I don't see why this does show you quantifier freeness. Yes, this, uh, this because the reason is the following. If we want to extend the first order theory with a new existential quantifier, and we want to extend this theory in a free way, what is the, 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 the best completion that, what is the best way to add a new existential quantifier? Well, we add an, an, existential, quantif uh, an existential quantifier and a, a proof if we have a witness. This is the idea. Okay, so, sounds good, excellent, makes sense. The idea is that the, the, the best way to introduce a new existential quantifier is to introduce an existential quantifier, which is in some sense very, very constructive, which has very constructive features. This is the idea. Okay. So, and we say that um, an existential doctrine has enough quantifier free objects if for every element alpha of a, a given fiber, there exists an object and a quantifier free element beta of this fiber, such that alpha is equal to this proposition. The idea is, is that the quantifier free elements cover all the fibers. This is the, the, the idea. Okay. Now we have that if P is a, an existential doctrine, well, P is an instance of existential completion if and only if P satisfies the rule of choice, P has enough P quantifier free objects, and for every P quantifier free element alpha and beta, well, we have that this, uh, this element is again a P quantifier free. So this is the characterization of the free algebras. Right. An example, if we consider the syntactic doctrine associated to the uh, regular logic, this is an elementary and existential doctrine. And this doctrine is the existential completion of the syntactic doctrine associated to the Horn fragment of logic. In particular, we have that the regular fragment of uh, first order intuitionistic logic 
satisfies the rule of choice. So this is an application. This is a, an, an easy proof of this uh, statement, of these uh, properties of the regular fragment of uh, logic. But presumably it was proved before without any higher order sort of ele element, right? Presumably people had proved before that. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, this is for the, the original proof involved the uh, cut elimination. And this is, uh, this is an easy proof, which, uh, well, we don't need anything ab about cut elimination. We just need about, we, we just need to apply the existential completion to this, uh, to this, um, to, okay. to the orange fragment and observe that uh, this is exactly the syntactic doc. This coincides with the syntactic doctrine associated to the regular fragment of logic. Okay. Very good. Now, the two categories of idempotent algebras. Well, we have that an existential doctrine is equipped with epsilon operators if and only if it is the canonical arrow denoted in this way from Px to P is an isomorphism. This means that the idempotent algebras for the monad associated to the existential completion are exactly the existential doctrines which are equipped with the epsilon operators. This is the second uh, characterization. Mm. So we we can so this is the the diagram that uh, we have seen in the introduction. The first equivalence is the equivalence between the two categories of um, existential doctrine and the two categories of algebras for the monad. Now, uh, we have uh, proved that the free algebras for, the, for this two monad corresponds to, the, to those existential doctrines, which essentially looks like their syntactic doctrine associated to the regular fragment of uh, logic. And we have that the potent algebras are exactly correspond to the two categories of um, was uh, objects are existential doctrines equipped with epsilon operator. So these are the two new characterization that uh, we have proved together with Milly and Margarita. Now, I want just to mention uh, another application of this construction, and uh, this uh, involves the univer uh, universal closure operation. So recall that if we have a primary doctrine P, we can define a, un a universal closure operation on uh, P in the following way. This is essentially an in the, uh, functor from P to P, an indexed functor from P to P, which preserves finite maths. It is idempotent and inflationary, which means that the identity is less or equal to this operation. This is uh, just a generalization of the usual definition of closure operation. So, as usual, given a, a universal closure operation on a doctrine, we can define, a, a, we can call an element a closed if this element alpha is equal to its closure. And similarly, we say that a proposition alpha is a dense if the closure of alpha is the top element. So. This, this is uh, just a generalization of the usual definitions. Now, notice that if uh, we have an existential doctrine, we can define a canonical uh, universal closure operation on its existential completion. This because uh, the existential completion essentially is uh, a, a two adjunction. So we can use the a unit and co-unit 
of these two monads to define a closure operation on the existential completion of an, an existential doctrine. And in particular, we have that if we consider the canonical universal um, operation, closure operation associated to a, an existential doctrine, we have that an element of the fiber is a closed if and only if it is equipped with an uh, essentially it is equipped with the, the, an epsilon operator. So an element is a closed if and only if there exists an arrow f from a to b such that this inequality holds. This uh, equality holds. Similarly, an element is a dense if and only if this is true. So this is a, an algebraic characterization. This is a, an algebraic characterization of those elements which are equipped with epsilon operators, and to those elements which are existentially true in some sense. This is a, another application of this construction. Now, I want to show how we can generalize the existential completion in order to freely add left uh, adjoint along an arbitrary class of morphisms closed under composition, pullbacks, and, ident and containing the identities. Well, the idea is, uh, is that the existential completion freely adds left adjoint along the class of projections. Well, the class if we well the class of, of uh, projections is closed under composition. It is closed under pullbacks because the, uh, pro the projections are stable under pullbacks and uh, it contains the identities. So we can easily generalize the existential completion. And in this case, if we consider a primary doctrine and a, a class denoted in this way of morphisms closed under composition, pullbacks and containing the identities, well, we can construct a new doctrine denoted in this way, such that this new doctrine has left adjoints along the class, along this class. So this is a, a direct generalization of the existential completion. We can add left adjoints along an arbitrary class of morphisms closed under pullback, composition, and the containing the identities. Okay, but why do we want to do that, David? Yes, we want to do that because there are a lot of um, um, there are a, a lot of doctrines which we will see in the final part, which are instances of this construction. So we can use the existential completion, the generalized existential completion, to show that, for example, <clears throat> the subobject doctrine as another universal satisfies another universal properties. This okay. is the, the the idea. Right. Okay. So a primary doctrine which has a left adjoint along uh, um, the morphism of a class closed under pullback composition and um, with identities is denoted in this way. So it is just a generalization of the existential completion. If this class is the class of projections, this is exactly the notion of uh, existential doctrine. Example, if we consider the weak subobject doctrine, well, this doctrine is an instance of a generalized existential completion. In particular, it is the existential completion of the primary doctrine denoted in this way, such that every, every fiber is trivial. So it contains only the top element. This is, the, this is a first example of generalized existential completion. Well, another interesting um, class of doctrines, which uh, we will see that uh, 
are instances of uh, the generalized existential completion is the, is the class of doctrines with full comprehensions. Well, if P is a primary doctrine and alpha is an object of, uh, of the fiber, a comprehension of alpha is an arrow from uh, an element X to A, such that this uh, the evaluation of the doctrine on uh, this arrow on alpha is true, and such that for every arrow f such that this is the top element, then there exists a unique map g such that f is equal to this composition. Well, the idea is the, is the following. If we have a primary doctrine, and we consider a, a proposition alpha, the object, this object <laughs> is essentially the, the set of all the X such that alpha of X. This is the, uh, the reason why we call uh, uh, an arrow of this kind a comprehension. So this is the, the the intuition behind the definition. And one says that the P has full comprehensions if every element alpha has a comprehension. And we say that a doctrine P has full comprehensions if moreover, we have that alpha is less or equal to beta whenever the comprehension of alpha factors through the comprehensions of beta. Now, if we have a primary doctrine with full comprehensions, then the comprehensions compose if and only if the doctrine has left adjoints along comprehensions satisfying back chevalier and Frobenius uh, reciprocity. This is the first result. The second one is that if we have a primary doctrine with full comprehensions and the left adjoints along the comprehensions, then this doctrine is isomorphic to the subobject doctrine. But in this case, the subobject is not all the subobject functor, but it is the formal subobject where this class is uh, the class of comprehensions. So this class essentially gives to the category C the structure of M category. The, there is a, this means that there is an equivalence between the two categories of primary doctrine with full comprehensions and left adjoints along comprehensions and the two categories of M categories. This is the, the meaning of this, uh, of this theorem. Yeah, but we don't know what an M category is, right? I mean, at least you didn't okay. tell me. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, we say that um, a category is, um, well, if we consider a class M of uh, morphisms, which are closed under composition, pullbacks, and which contains the identities, well, we say that a category together with this class is an M category. This is the, so we say, we say that uh, for a given class, uh, it, we say that a category is a, a M category if and only if the, 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 the class of morphism of uh, M is closed under composition, pullbacks and containing the identities. This is the, the definition of uh, an M category. It's a, it's a category together with a, a class of morphisms with these three properties. Sounds good. So another example, which is the last one, is the following. We have that uh, every, if we have a, a primary doctrine with the full comprehensions and the comprehension compose, well, this doctrine is an instance of the generalized existential completion where this class is the class of comprehensions. In particular, again, we have that the doctrine P 
is the generalized existential completion of the primary doctrine, which has essentially trivial fiber. So we have that for every object A, this poset contains only the top element. So all the doctrine which are uh, which uh, has full comprehensions and the comprehension compose are instances of the generalized existential completion. And well, with the, this uh, example, I I conclude this presentation. I would just I would I would like just to mention <coughs> another application of uh, a similar uh, free construction which. Uh, involves the, the, the existential completion, essentially the, the completion of uh, the existential completion. Well, this a similar, um, a, a similar construction is involved in the construction of the dialectica category or more generally of uh, the dialectica vibration associated to an arbitrary vibration. So if we have an arbitrary vibration, we can apply the universal completion, then the existential completion, which are the, the general version of this existential completion and the corresponding universal completion. And what we obtain is exactly a vibration whose base category is a dialectical category. And so as a future work, well, we, I think that we could use, we could generalize this uh, the definition, these uh, definitions and these uh, uh, techniques in order to study the dialectical construction. And uh, with uh, this remark, I, I have finished. And if you have any question, please, uh, you can ask me. Very good, very good. Excellent, excellent. Um, very exciting work and I finally understood some of what your thesis is about so kind of that's that's great uh, yeah some questions kind of but let's see if other people have them first so do we have any other people wanting to ask questions right now I was just generally impressed by this like uh, next step in abstraction and generalization of the idea that we're probably all know. So it's like, I'll have to rewatch it again, but it's really, really, very really interesting. Exciting work, yeah, I think, I, I agree. Very, very exciting. Much. Um, so uh, let me kind of try a little bit. Do you mind going back to the, the first three examples of the existential completion? Yes, the, the, first, the first three examples. Yeah. Because, yes, that's, that's exactly the same. Um, so what I'm kind of um, worrying about is that, you see, the second example, we weaken the pullbacks, but we never weakened before the products. The, the first example, you know, we don't, we don't start from a tensor product. We always start from a real product. Yes. So, you know, we start from regular categories, and and when we kind of go to the the uh, the pullback, we can say, okay, maybe maybe we don't have a a a, a real pullback. We have just a weak pullback, and so you know, it looks as if we might have a different kind of generalization that goes to more um, to less established things, because because if you started from if you started from weak products and even weak terminal objects, you, you have much less information. But but you know all the guys in the ACT community, all the guys in the applied category theory community, they they only like that. They don't really play with real products. They they just think of tensor products all the time. So it's just for you to put on your in the back of your mind that you might want to think what would have happened. But, but you know, this is really very beautiful. And I, I kind of finally understand a little bit more, not, not totally, but a little bit more what's happening. And, and, and then I, I have the question 
Uh, the question that really is eating me up is this business that I never liked the Epsilon operator. I mean, Vlad, you know what the Epsilon operator is, don't you? The, this, this thing that Hubert invented that says not only that there exists something that satisfies the proposition A, but it's unique. And, you know, I never liked that stuff because I always thought that that was confusing the issues. Um, that one of the good things of Frege's uh, formalization of first order logic was to say, there might be something uh, and for all things and, and didn't kind of try to, to connect that with the choices in, 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 in logic because choice in logic is very hard, right? You know, there's, there's an awful lot that, I mean, and people tend to think of that as being, choice in logic is set theory, it's harder than logic. And you know, most of the stuff that we're talking about here is logic, but now you kind of come with this, um, com with this different way of cutting things up and saying, okay, I, I will put, I mean, and you're doing that more than once. And, and also Milian and, and, and Pino were doing that too, because you know, you're putting the comprehensions together with the logic and, 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 and the epsilon operators together with the logic. So it's, I, I don't understand it. <laughs> so the, the, if, if I, I understand the point, well, the reason why Milly and Pino intro, intro, introduced and used the epsilon operators is the following. Well, we have that uh, we can, we know that we can construct an exact category starting from an elementary and existential doctrine. Mm -hmm. But if we start, for example, by uh, with an, an elementary and existential doctrine, was base category as finite limits, well, we can construct an exact category. Now, the question is when this exact category is the, the exact completion of the base category of a doctrine, the answer is this exact category is the exact completion of the base category of a doctrine if and only if the base category has um, epsilon operator. This is the, the reason. Because, uh, you know, we have uh, the, the, the exact completion for a, a category with finite limits and the exact completion for an elementary and existential doctrine. The, 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 the question is uh, when, uh, if we start, for example, yes, with a, a category with finite, a finite limits or a regular category, when these two completion coincide, the answer is uh, the, when uh, the doctrine is equipped with the epsilon operators. But, but you, you see, David, now that, we have the, that you have the beautiful uh, categorical theorem, you have to bring it back to the logic and see what the hell is happening there. And that's the thing that is kind of disturbing me a little bit. I mean, that's why I kept saying, okay, the whole logic fragment, we knew that already, we had another proof. Uh, now we have this, this generic big fact and I don't understand. Another, I, another I think that another interesting application in, in logic of this construction is the following. We know that the existential completion extends a theory to a theory which satisfies the rule of choice. So for example, if we prove that the existential completion preserves, for example, the arbitrary join, this, uh, this is an example. Well, we can extend the, essentially the sub-object on a given topos to uh, the, the theory, which a, a theory, a geometric theory. So we can apply the existential completion to the sub-object doctrine on a given topos. And we obtain a new doctrine, which is again, which essentially corresponds to a geometric theory and which satisfies the rule of choice. So if we prove that this uh, construction preserve, for example, we know that the, this construction preserves the arbitrary join in the in, a, in the fi of the fibers, so we can apply this uh, this construction to extend a given theory to another theory, to another geometric theory which satisfies the rule of choice. 
this is another uh, application of this construction if we we want to apply to, to use this construction in logic so if you want for example to do constructive mathematics and uh, you have uh, uh, a theory it may be happened that uh, you, this theory does not satisfy the rule of choice but if you want to be constructive well you can extend this this theory and adding this uh, this rule of choice yeah no that's this is very exciting and and to me a little bit surprising i, I need to understand it a bit better i mean i think I understand the calculations. I don't. Just, I'm sorry. I'm lying. I I understand. I, I think I understand how you're going to make the calculations, at least the, the, which is very good of you. You know, to be able to show how the proof will uh, fit together. That's that's very good. But um, but you know, I think the inferences that then we kind of make in logic, they are not the the import the importance of of that in the logic uh, to begin with I, I don't quite follow but 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 i'm i'm willing to kind of carry on working and seeing how how things kind of fit it's very nice thank you very much thank you anyone wants to say something else Then I think we just quiet. thank you and kind of let you go because it's dinner time for you. <laughs> yes. Late yeah. dinner time for you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, David. Thank you. And, and thank, thank you, you Vlad. For, for, yes, for, I'm finishing recording, right? Okay. Yes, please. Okay, thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye, guys. Lovely to see you. See you. <laughs>